the world's midwifery report for 2021, the third such report and produced jointly by UNFPA, WHO and the ICM or the International Confederation of Midwives. I am Dr. Anshu Banerjee, I'm the Director for Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging at WHO and I will be moderating the event today together with my colleague Dr. Annika Knudsen, who is the Chief Sexual and Reproductive Health Branch at UNFPA. We have an exciting program ahead of us with opening remarks by Dr. Tedros, the WHO Director General, and Natalia Kanem, the Executive Director of UNFPA, followed by two panel discussions with a Q&A, and the event will be closed by Dr. Franca Cadet, the President of the International Confederation of Midwives. The World Health Assembly starts next week, and we want to ensure that all Ministers of Health have had the opportunity to learn more about the SOMI report or the State of the Midwifery, World Midwifery Report and hear your views before the World Health Assembly begins. It is also special because there will be a resolution on nursing and midwifery at the World Health Assembly, the first in 10 years. A few logistics. Interpretation is available in six languages and in sign language. Any questions for the Q&A can be put in the chat, either for the Zoom or also in the chat for YouTube. Now, it's a great privilege that we have our WHO Director General with us in person today, and I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Um, Thank you, Archie. Can you hear me? Yes, over to you. Thank you. So dear uh, Franca and dear Natalia, uh, excellencies, esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends. I would like to start by offering my thanks to the United Nations Population Fund and the International Confederation of Midwives for partnering with WHO to launch this important report. Its publication presents us with a much needed opportunity to discuss the future of midwifery at the global level. It's impossible to overstate just how important a role midwives play in providing a wide range of essential services for sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health. Across the world, they reduce the risks of childbirth and give vital support to childbearing women and newborns. They also contribute to broader health goals, such as improving sexual and reproductive rights, promoting self-care interventions, and empowering women and adolescent girls. Over the past 16 months, many midwives have been exposed to risk during the COVID-19 pandemic, and some have made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of others. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the world's midwives from the bottom of my heart for your hard work and dedication to improving the health and lives of others. Last year, 2020 was the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. The State of the World's Midwifery 2021 report is an outcome of that year and a vital tool for improving health outcomes across the world. The report highlights that despite the important role they play, there is a global shortage of 900,000 midwives with low income countries, especially in Africa, facing the most acute scarcity. The result of this shortage is that an estimated 810 women die every single day as a result of complications of pregnancy and childbirth. There is one stillbirth every 16 seconds and 2.4 million newborn deaths 
each year. Almost one in five women gives birth without assistance from a skilled health provider. Urgent investment in midwifery is needed in four main areas. First, we urge countries to pay careful attention to health workforce planning, management, and regulation, and to working environment. This means greater autonomy for midwives within healthcare teams and providing an enabling work environment free from gender related stigma, violence, and discrimination. Second, we urge countries to invest in high quality education and training for midwives. This involves the equitable provision of competent educators and trainers alongside well-resourced education and training in institutions. Third, midwife-led improvements to service delivery, such as midwife-led models of care. And fourth, leadership and governance with senior midwife positions in government, research, and education. The report also demonstrates that the benefits of this investment are significant. Fully resourcing midwife delivered care by 2035 could save an estimated 4.3 million lives per year. Investment in midwives helps to promote the health and well being of women, adolescents, and newborns, increases the economic participation of women in the workforce, and contributes to women's empowerment and gender equality. Fully integrating midwives in healthcare teams can also increase access to health services, including by the most vulnerable populations. The evidence from both the State of the World Midwifery 2021 report and the WHO State of the World Nursing 2020 report directly informed the new global strategic directions for nursing and midwifery. This document provides evidence-based policy priorities to help countries maximize the potential of midwives and nurses. It includes approaches to ensure that these vital health workers are fully contributing towards the achievement of universal health coverage and the sustainable development goals. At the World Health Assembly next week, member states will have the chance to adopt a resolution on the strategic directions for nursing and midwifery. This will be the first resolution focused on nursing and midwifery in 10 years, which is an appropriate way to mark the year of health and care workers. I'm confident member states will adopt the resolution but that matters more what but what matters more is its implementation the strong health systems rely on health workers who are supported protected motivated and equipped to deliver safe care at all times the takeaway could not be clearer now is the time to invest in midwives i want to thank all my colleagues and our partners for your hard work and dedication in bringing this report to life. Now, we must all use the findings of this report to bring about the change we need to maximize the full potential of midwives. Once again, I want to acknowledge midwives for everything you do to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. I thank you. And Shu, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. And those were very uplifting words. Uh, there will be no doubt amongst midwives on the call today how much you care about midwifery and midwives and how much WHO values midwifery and midwives.
Unfortunately, uh, Natalia Cannon, the executive director for UNFPA, is unable to join us today, but she has some key messages to share with us and will address us with a pre recorded video. Natalia Cannon, over to you. Honorable ministers and government representatives, Dr. Tedros, Dr. Kade, partners and colleagues, greetings everyone. UNFPA remains steadfastly committed to strengthening midwifery, which is so essential to sexual reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent health care, and to building resilient health systems for women, for families, for young people, and indeed for everyone. I wish every girl could come through her adolescence and into womanhood safely. And if she chooses motherhood, to give birth safely. Like Ida, who at age 19 decided to get married and start a family because the time was right for her. One of Ida's aunts is a midwife and she explained to her the importance of preparing well, of building a solid, healthy foundation for the new family. She talked about using modern contraceptives, seeking professional midwifery care to stay healthy and how to prepare for the birth, to deliver safely, and the importance of receiving timely care and the information needed to give her baby a healthy start in life and to stay healthy herself. Ida's aunt helped her throughout the pregnancy and the birth of her beautiful son. However, not every woman is so fortunate. The state of the world's midwifery report sounds the alarm that currently the world needs over 1.2 million essential health workers to deliver sexual reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent health care. And three quarters of these missing essential health workers are midwives. A capable, well-trained midwife can have an enormous impact on childbearing women and their families an impact that's often passed on from one generation to the next. The COVID-19 pandemic brings home the importance of investment in primary health care. And midwives are essential providers of primary health care. Midwives are rightly famous as providers of maternity care. They also provide a wide range of clinical services that contribute to better health, such as promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights, including self-care interventions and empowering women and adolescent girls. We now have a, lot, a large body of evidence that shows that a midwife-led model of care can improve service delivery and increase uptake of care by women and their families. So here are four compelling reasons why governments should invest in professionally educated and regulated midwives, according to this landmark State of the World's Midwifery Report. Number one, universal access to midwifery could save at least 4 million lives every year by 2035. Second, midwifery puts safe, effective, and respectful care within the reach of even the hardest to reach women and families. Number three, midwifery contributes to women's empowerment and gender equality. And number four, midwifery contributes significantly to national and local economies. Let's remember that while thankfully for Aida, her pregnancy had a happy ending, every year on the order of 300,000 women still die because of maternal mortality to end these preventable deaths and to ensure that every pregnancy is wanted and safe. Patients need timely, culturally sensitive support. To achieve that, it only makes perfect sense to support the midwives who are the key providers of women's services. Let's also remember that most midwives are indeed women who understand and also experience the same inequities that women at large face. Bold investments are needed to improve midwi midwife's work environment 
and to ensure gender equitable health systems and provide pathways to leadership. Bigger and more focused investments in midwifery education and training in primary health care and in creating an enabling gender transformative work environment. This is crucial. Let's create those opportunities for strengthening midwifery leadership, professional associations, and strong partnerships with other health professionals. The State of World's Midwifery Report 2021 is a clarion call to action during the Decade of Action on the Sustainable Development Goals, and we trust and count on your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. And uh, you'll also be able to tell from this wonderful message from UNFPA that they also care deeply about midwifery and midwives and that they support midwives and the investments to enable them to carry out their important work. So next, I would like to um, move to the panel discussion that we have with a couple of key uh, dignitaries. And um, first of all, I would like to, um, and I hope that we'll have all five esteemed panelists on the call. I think some are still trying to dial in. But they will be highlighting the four investments that Dr. Tetros highlighted that have come out of the SOMU report. Thank you all for joining us today. First, I would like to call on Neha Mankini. Um, Neha, welcome. You have been selected by the International Confederation of Midwives as a young midwife leader. Huge congratulations to you. Your leadership will be critical for the future of Pakistan's midwives and the women, newborns, and families they care for. You have heard the Director General say that the SOMI report highlights that we need to invest in midwifery leadership. Can you tell us a bit about your leadership as a midwife in Pakistan and what the result of that is? Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, and thank you, ICM, for the opportunity to participate in this panel and to speak on behalf of midwives. So the State of the World's Midwifery Report has very clearly provided evidence that midwives are not only improving health outcomes for women and their babies during the childbirth continuum, but they're also being able to provide the majority of essential sexual and reproductive care that is part of the broader primary health services needed to promote universal health coverage. And if we're able to educate enough midwives to international standards and regulated and they're regulated and deployed within supportive and integrated integrated health services that enable them to work across the full scope of practice, midwives can help to substantially reduce maternal and neonatal mortality and stillbirths, and thereby saving millions of lives each year. The structure and organization of healthcare systems and the economic, social, and cultural context in which they operate do differ widely between countries, which in turn influences the models of maternity care that are available to childbearing women in different countries. So as we see, saw in the State of the World's Midwifery Report, the, it's recommended that mid, um, re, midwife-led continuity of care models be used in which a known midwife or a small group of known midwives supports women throughout the antenatal, intrapartum, and postnatal continuum. So research has been done in different contexts, and it's shown that midwife-led continuity of care leads to reductions in neonatal deaths, preterm births, stillbirths, less use of epidural, episiotomy, and reduction in instrumental births. How, and there's also been an increase in spontaneous, spontaneous vaginal deliveries and an increase in women's satisfaction with the birth process, but there's been no increase in the risk of harm. So investment in midwives also leads to lower costs of care for women and greater access to care for women, especially in low resource settings like the one that I'm based in. Midwife-led continuity of care enables each woman and her midwife team to get to know each other through the process and the duration of the childbirth continuum, and they build a reciprocal relationship, which is based on trust, equity, informed choice, and shared decision-making and responsibility. As highlighted in the report, implementing and scaling up midwife-led continuity of care module, models really sustainably really requires addressing the challenges that we are facing right now, which is midwives education, regulation, and working environment. This has been true for Pakistan, where despite really poor maternal and neonatal health indicators, midwives consistently rank low in government scales, are not recognized distinctly as trusted providers, and are disallowed from practicing independently. 
midwifery schools operated by the government are being shut down in many parts of the country due to a lack of understanding of the contribution of this carrier to key health outcomes. As part of my current role, in the past three years, I have helped set up and manage seven midwife-led continuity of care services at primary care sites around Pakistan, which are operated independently by community midwives. These sites are across different rural parts of the country. A lot of them are really hard to reach. And then one of them includes a remote island off of Karachi in the middle of the Arabian Sea. There are midwives on board Pakistan's first boat clinic on the Indus River. These midwives are everywhere. And they, um, they offer a range of services, including antenatal care, birthing, postnatal care, family planning, lactation work, and well-baby and well-woman care. So these midwife-led models, which started as a small pilot project, have now changed the maternal health landscape in all the areas in which they operate, with significant increases in skilled birth attendance. There's an increase in trust, increased trust in healthcare and reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidities among women who were previously very dependent on traditional birth attendance, which often led to disastrous outcomes for mothers and babies. And because of the nature of the relationship between midwives and families, we have also seen increased uptake of services due to the respectful, personalized, client-centered care that midwives are providing to women. These services have succeeded because they have they are run privately and therefore not reliant on government support. My experience with midwife-led models in Pakistan has reinforced for me the universality of this model in different contexts and the value it has for health outcomes for women, newborns, families, and entire societies. And I really hope that going forward, we can get all midwives the recognition they need of their impact on health equity and quality healthcare, and their lived experiences and impact can be taken into account when it comes to policy making and standards of practice for all maternity services in Pakistan, including those that are funded by the government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neha. And um, thanks for that contribution. We will now move to the next panel member. And um, unfortunately, the Minister of Health from India could not join. He is in a meeting with the Prime Minister discussing the COVID response. But in his place, we have Dr. Nipon Vinayak, who is the Joint Secretary Nursing from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare from India. Thank you for joining us. Um, India is doing so much to improve the quality of care from women and newborns, for women and newborns, and particularly including investing in midwifery education. Um, education and training are one of the four investments highlighted in the SOMIA report. Uh, Dr. Vinayak, can you tell us a bit about midwifery education in India? Over to you, sir. Good evening uh, to all the ladies and gentlemen present in this uh, launch and policy dialogue of the State of World's Midwifery Report. Uh, my name is Nipun Vinayak and I'm speaking on behalf of our Honorable Minister for Health, who could not remain present due to some prior uh, uh, preoccupation. Uh, Dr. Tedros, Director General WHO, Dr. Kenham, uh, Executive Director UNFPA, Dr. Caddy, President ICM, and all the eminent guests, greetings from India. Uh, it gives us great pleasure to see the evidence on midwifery in the latest report, which has highlighted the need for major focus on investment in health workforce for maternal and newborn care. I'm delighted to share that the Government of India, under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi is taking a number of steps towards transformation of the health systems and investment in key areas, including midwifery, as is the subject of discussion today. As the report has accepted, we have already initiated midwifery education program of global standard after the launch of the midwifery services guidelines in December 2018. I would like to uh, announce to this August gathering a very significant development that's happening in our country. This is as far as the regulation of the nursing sector is concerned. We are aware that 2020, the last year was declared by WHO as the year of nursing and midwifery. Uh, this was the year when uh, our government initiated the process of um, streamlining the major legislation for nursing 
which is uh, decades old and goes by the name Indian Nursing Council Act through a new legislation which we are bringing in and the new legislation will be called the National Nursing and Midwifery Commission. It's very important to note that the word midwifery has been incorporated in the name itself by, and this uh, signifies the movement uh, on part of government to recognize the importance of midwifery in the overall profession of nursing. We hope that this uh, legislation will be passed uh, by the parliament in the coming year. Uh, we have also taken steps with respect to other fields uh, wherein investment was expected uh, to mention a few, a strategic roadmap for effective rollout of the midwifery initiative has been worked out, which includes curriculum, scope and standards of practice, advocacy toolkits and learning resource packages for both the midwifery educator program and the nurse practitioner in midwifery. This has the objective of raising midwifery education and service provision to global standards. In addition, a national task force for midwifery has been established to enable midwifery professionals to contribute to the policy process. I would also like to make a mention that the curricula and training has been updated and implemented from 12 months course to 18 months course as was recommended by the International Confederation of Midwives. We have placed qualified midwifery educators as a crucial resource in taking this initiative for a national level scale up. We plan to initiate midwifery educators training in 14 centers of excellence across the country. We have also initiated the first midwifery leadership program to ensure that the leaders uh, who are leading the way should implement this ambitious initiative. I take this opportunity to express sincere thanks to WHO and all the partners for support, uh, supporting our country's uh, initiative. Uh, that is all I would like to say from uh, our country's uh, behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vinayak, and, and particularly also for highlighting how much the Prime Minister is behind this initiative. Um, next, we will move to um, Mrs. Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Jamaica. Minister, thank you very much for joining us and for all your support to the SOMI report, first of all, but also to the strategic directions for nursing and midwifery, the, your support to the resolution for nursing and midwifery that will be discussed by member states at the World Health Assembly next week as well. And as the minister in Jamaica, what do you think the investment in midwifery workforce for sexual reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health means for you? Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. And um, definitely, we are very pleased to be here. Jamaica is very pleased to be here. Um, Dr. Tedros, um, Director General of the WHO, Dr. Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of UNFPA, uh, my colleague ministers, other distinguished guests and participants online, good afternoon to you all. Um, it is definitely an honor and a pleasure to be a part of the, this event to launch the State of the World Midwifery 2021 report. Over the past year, the world has experienced one of the greatest challenges um, in recent history, the COVID-19 pandemic has claimed millions of lives and has changed the ways in which we relate to navigate the world. Undoubtedly, these are unprecedented times and as such, I embrace this opportunity to salute all healthcare workers. This is a timely publication. Nurses and midwives specifically make up more than half the healthcare workers worldwide and therefore are the backbone of our health systems. Moreover, they are critical contributors to achieving national health care goals and by extension, the sustainable development goals in particular SDG3. It is for this reason, that we are pleased that the WHA deem it appropriate to continue the focus on nurse and midwives by designating 2021 as the International Year of the Healthcare Workers under the theme Protect, Invest Together. 
It also gives renewed impetus to the work started in 2020 during the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, which has championed mm, in 2029 as member of the executive board. Excellencies and colleagues, this is an issue which is of critical importance to Jamaica's national development objective and which is accorded priority at the highest political level. It was therefore only natural for Jamaica to show leadership by piloting a resolution on strengthening nursing and midwifery for the 74th World Health Assembly, which will lead to the adoption of the Global Strategic Directions for Nursing and Midwifery 2021 to 2025. This will be the first resolution focused on nursing and midwifery in 10 years. We hope it will help to focus policy action and investments in the, the education, employment, leadership, and work environments of nurse and midwives, optimizing their contribution to health and population around the world. Jamaica is particularly delighted for this report, which has clearly highlighted that there are too few midwives in the world. There is currently global need-based shortage of 1.1 million dedicated sexual reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent health workforce, workers of which 900,000 are midwives. In Jamaica's context, the country is functioning at 50% of its actual midwifery capacity. It is troubling that as forecasted, the gap in the health workforce needs will strength continue to widen by the year 2030, undermining the achievements of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The, this inequitable distribution of midwives across countries is an impediment to achieving universal health coverage. In resolving these challenges, there is a need for greater investments in creating more midwifery jobs, strengthening their education and training, cultivating their health policy leadership, as well as providing safer and more supportive work environments. As called for this in the SOMI report 2021, the global and national investment in these areas should be bold. There is now a large body of evidence which shows that investing in midwives facilitates positive birth experiences, improves health outcomes, increased workforce supply, it favors inclusive and equitable growth, economic stabilization, and can have a positive macroeconomic impact. Excellencies, colleagues, it is for this reason that Jamaica welcomes that there is a clear evidence in the state of the world's midwifery 2021 report, which points and commits to an agenda that will drive and sustain progress to 2030. Let us then redouble our efforts to accelerate investment in midwifery health workforce planning, the management and regulations, and in the work environment, high quality education and training of midwives. Midwife led improvements to the, the sexual reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent um, health services delivery and the midwifery leadership governance. In closing, I want to register Jamaica's appreciation to this report. Jamaica will be using this data provided to this report as a benchmark against which to evaluate our own situation as well as to reposition and to strengthen the health workforce generally and specifically the nursing and midwifery professionals to meet the changing needs and of course, the new normal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for all your support and indeed your, your strong support to take this even forward at the global level and support WHO at the World Health Assembly with this. Um, I would now like to move over to Dr. Wilhelm Mina Jala, who is the Minister of Health in Liberia. And uh, Dr. Jala, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Liberia has weathered many storms, conflicts, the Ebola outbreak, and we're very glad to know that so far, the COVID-19 rates have been actually very low, and uh, I'm sure that it has been the response from the ministry learning from previous outbreaks that has enabled you to manage this so far. 
Um, all this time, you have continued to invest in midwifery-led service delivery, one of the four investments in the SOMI report. Can you tell us about why and how you are investing in midwife-led service delivery in Liberia? Over to you, Your Excellency, Dr. Jalla. Uh, thank you for the right to this uh, well uh, knowledgeable program. Uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General for the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Nat Natalie Cannon, Executive Director, UNFPA, Dr. Asha, Director of the Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health and Aging, uh, Honorable Ministers of Health, esteemed midwives present, members of the International Confederation of Midwives, distinguished colleagues. It is indeed an honor to be invited to form a part of this high level launch and policy dialogue on the state of the world, Midwifery 2021. Having had the opportunity to go through the UNFPA 2021 fast fact, I am happy for the progress that has been made and remain hopeful for what is yet to come. The shocking unfavorable data outlined in the report should serve as a wake up call to each and every one of us. For those who are yet to read the report, here are some numbers that should trigger our attention. Midwives are providing about 90% of the sexual reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent healthcare needs, yet they account for 10% of the global SRMNAH workforce. Despite the unknown and disputed impact of the midwives on the global health force, the world still falls short of over 900,000 more midwives in low income countries like Liberia. At current rate, there will be a shortage of 750,000 midwives in 2030. These numbers should frighten us all. If there was ever a time for governments, policymakers, and the global community to commit more investment towards training and development of midwives, now is that time. With all additional investment, the gap between the rich and the poor countries is projected to widen by 2030. With the four areas urgently in need of investment, I would like to provide some information on midwives led improvement service delivery, particularly in the context of Korea. Midwives are in charge of the MCH, maternal newborn units, in all of our hospitals, health centers, and clinics around Liberia. Liberia acknowledged of the critical roles of our midwifery profession is evidenced by the emphasis in the national health policy and plan, the investment plan for building a resilient health system and other important policies documented on building and sustaining a fit for purpose health workforce. What have Liberia done thus far? Midwives with additional skills are being reprofiled to ensure that the remediation commensurate with the tasks assigned. Also, unlike in the past times where there existed no clear way to career growth, midwives are now provided the opportunity to excel at the university, at the undergraduate degree we plan to commence postgraduate midwifery training. Below are efforts, among others, process being made. Through our task steering program, 19 midwives train and now performing obstetric surgery in highly challenged rural hospitals, while 18 are being trained to also provide obstetric 
emergency surgery, as well as critical neonatal care. To prepare them for the future task sharing, midwives are giving extra skills and trained to provide obstetrical emergency surgeries, critical neonatal and pediatric cares. Hospitals are being equipped with critical life-saving equipment, enabling the environment for the midwife to perform their tasks. Rural midwife training institutions are producing qualified midwives to try to close our gaps in period. Delays in every delivery room in hospital, healthcare clinics is lifted through the use of solar suitcases. Now, what are our uh, Liberia's commitment? The benefit of investing in building the capacity of midwives cannot be overemphasized. An adequately well equipped and strengthened mid Wifer force is critical to reducing Liberia stackling maternal and new. newborn mentality, size training of nurses and midwives. We want to support the participation in a national and international training conference and symposium gearing at professional groups and development. Collaboration with training institutions and postgraduate schools to develop continuing education programs for skill enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, Liberia appreciates the effort as a guide and commits to implementing the recommendations that were provided by this document. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Jalan, and for highlighting the innovations that you are bringing in um, and, and supporting the work. Um, we'll go to the final panel member for this first panel, and that will be Dr. Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, the Chief Midwifery Officer for England within the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Um, Dr. Bentley, uh, Dunkley Bent, you are the first Chief Midwifery Officer in England, indeed across the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Many congratulations to you. Uh, it has been just over 120 years. Uh, 120 years since the first Midwives Act in the UK, and this was when midwives became the professionals they deserve to be. What has been your experience so far as the first Chief Midwifery Officer? What has worked well? Please let us know so that others listening can learn from you and, and we can all support the strengthening of midwifery leadership. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you. It's such a privilege to be able to speak to you all today, um, Your Excellencies, uh, leaders, ministers, and fellow midwives. What an absolute pleasure to read this uh, State of the World Midwifery Report, an absolutely phenomenal report full of facts and sobering figures. First of all, I'd like to say that every time I look at the report, and read approximately 810 maternal deaths every day, one stillbirth every 16 seconds, 2.4 million newborn deaths each year. We haven't gone into the detail about avoidability, but what those data tell me is that the midwife role is significant. We know from evidence that if you have a midwife, you save a life in the UK, in England, I'm representing England, we say, based on the evidence, if you have a midwife, you improve outcomes for mums and babies. I've said this so many times in the last few weeks, what we do as midwives ripples through generations, ripples through generations, such is the significance. So with those data that are very clearly outlined in this excellent report, we have a responsibility based on the evidence to ensure that we develop our midwives. The report uh, refers to uh, respectful maternity. The report refers to investing in midwives. The report identifies the autonomous nature of the midwife's role. And what's really significant for me in the report is something about 
uh, enabling and, and empowering uh, midwives to inform uh, a building a better and fairer uh, midwifery maternity system post pandemic. So another key thing before I respond uh, to the findings of the report, another key element that I'd like to emphasize that, that was really um, quite significant for me to read in the report was that only half of reporting countries have midwife leaders within their national ministry of health. Limited opportunities for midwives to hold leadership positions and the scarcity of women who are role models in leadership positions and, mid and midwives uh, career advancement and their ability to work to their full potential. And I reflect on the Royal College of Midwives leadership framework and manifesto and how that has influenced me and the Lancet series and other evidence to think about our contribution uh, in terms of responding to this significant report and thinking about midwifery and maternity within the borders of England. And so we have, we naturally want to save lives and improve maternity outcomes. So based on the fact that the midwife is an autonomous practitioner, midwives save, save lives and understanding the recognition of what a midwife does, it's really important, I think, that everywhere, globally, the impact of what a midwife does and the significance of that impact rippling through generations, saving lives, means that there needs to be enough midwives and commitment to education not just education to prepare midwives to be midwives, but continuous professional development, such as the value and respect that I feel should be placed on the role of the midwife so that we can save lives, so that those data that I recalled uh, a few minutes ago will not be a reality in the next report. So what have we done in England? Well, we have uh, in the midst of the pandemic, based on all the things that I've shared, we have, uh, I have, as the first Chief Midwifery Officer, I have taken uh, the impact of the role of the midwife exceptionally seriously. And along with the CNO, the Chief Nursing Officer for England, we have a phenomenal relationship. And our CNO in England truly understands the impact of the midwife role and the difference between midwives and nurses and therefore I have recruited two deputy chief midwifery officers because leadership is significant in terms of saving lives and improving outcomes maternal and baby neonatal outcomes we've also recruited seven regional chief midwives now what that means to everybody across the globe is is that England is divided into regions and in each region we have a chief midwife all uh, uh, developed and implemented and recruited during uh, 2020, the, the, at, the, at the height of the pandemic year, the global pandemic year. So the structure in England creates that leadership foundation. Number one, that young midwives or midwives that are very experienced can think about, I'd like to develop my career by being a regional leader as a chief midwife, of which there are seven regions and seven regional chief midwives, and indeed, or indeed, deputy chief midwife, midwifery officers, or indeed um, becoming the chief midwifery officer for the future. I'm looking out now for the person that that might be. And so that they're just a few things that we've done in England responding to that leadership challenge um, presented in several reports and least of all uh, the most current report, the state of the world's midwifery. We've also in recent times, and I'm talking about a few months, invested in midwives in England. So the state of the world midwifery report calls for investment and that's what we have done. Uh, we have uh, 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 been successful in a recent business case that means that we will be able to recruit 1,000 more midwives over this year, 1,000 more, 80 more consultant obstetricians and seven deputy regional chief midwives. These are people that will deputize to the midwives in the region. Why? Because we are taking leadership and the autonomous role of the midwife seriously, and acknowledging, again, 
what midwives do ripples through generations and saves lives. What I'd also like to say is Scotland have an advert out at the moment to recruit the first ever chief midwifery officer in Scotland. They currently have a chief midwifery advisor, but the ad advert is now out for a chief midwifery officer. So 50% of the UK will have chief midwifery officers in post. So I've just given a little example about what I have done along with the CNO uh, in England to build the infrastructure for midwifery, because if we get the foundational principles right, then we can truly embrace uh, saving lives and improving outcomes. And our maternity and midwifery policies in England, Better Births, the report of the National Maternity Review and the NHS long-term plan play to all the things that I've said, because if you have a midwife, you save a life. So that's just a little example from England. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duncan Bent. And uh, maybe I could just ask the IT people to allow us to switch on our cameras because I think we lost uh, the image for Dr. Duncan Bent and my own image as well. Thank you, IT. Wonderful. So that brings us, uh, and thank you very much for highlighting the, um, the, um, the, the leadership that you are creating around midwifery in the, U in the UK, basically now that Scotland is joining the initiative that has happened already in England. Uh, thank you very much for that. So, so that brings us to the next panel. And I would like to thank all the previous panelists for joining us. Thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to Annika, uh, Dr. Annika Knutsen, uh, who is my colleague in UNFPA and the chief for sexual reproductive health branch. And um, Annika herself is a huge champion for midwives. So Annika, over to you to guide us through the next panel and the Q&A. Thank you, Andrew. And I just want to say a big thank you to you all honorable ministers and honorable midwife leaders for that very rich discussion. Uh, I, I think the sign interpreter does not hear me for some reason. Can anyone hear me? Everybody hears you. He's fine. Okay. So we, okay. So I, just wanted to also say that it escapes no one. The passion, the urgency, and the momentum that all the speakers have brought to the first panel to materialize what we all are trying so hard to do, to get midwives there as the essential pillar in the SRM and CAH workforce. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce another round of speakers from our virtual floor, representing another set of very important perspectives in the multi-partner and stakeholder constituency around the SRM and CAH workforce and midwives in particular. So let me start by introducing Flor Francisconi, her full name is actually Maria Florencia Francisconi, but she's known as Flor, who is a board member for the International Confederation of Midwives representing Latin America. And she is also a midwife practitioner, manager, trainer, and researcher. Flor will bring us a bit of a picture of the realities of daily practice for a midwife. Over to you, Flor. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will be speaking in Spanish, so please switch on your translation. Thank you. Quiero agradecerles el privilegio de poder estar con ustedes y hacerles llegar eh, un poquito de, de la práctica diaria de la matronería eh, en Latinoamérica. Si bien es una profesión que nos llena de orgullo y, y nos trae muchísimas satisfacciones, la realidad es que muchas veces los gobiernos regionales no están a la altura de la evidencia científica y los datos que hoy gracias a documentos como el SOMI tenemos a nuestro alcance para poder avanzar hacia una atención de calidad. Para que esta atención cumpla efectivamente ciertos estándares, la ICM es muy clara en cuanto a nuestro marco profesional, en cuanto a nuestras competencias profesionales y en cuanto a nuestros pilares también. 
eh, en estos pilares la regulación y la educación son fundamentales. Entonces surgen algunas cuestiones en nuestra realidad, en nuestra práctica diaria, como por ejemplo, ¿cómo es posible que en Argentina todavía existan colegas que se forman con planes de estudios adecuados a nuestra, com nuestras competencias, listas para poder brindar paquetes completos de prestaciones en salud sexual y reproductiva, pero que tengan un marco regulatorio profesional nacional restrictivo, que no acompañe su formación, y que las considere como meras colaboradoras médicas. Y yendo un poco, eh, avanzando sobre esta cuestión aún un poco más, ¿qué intereses existen en el medio para que estas leyes no se actualicen? Como parteras profesionales y con foco siempre en las mujeres y en sus familias, hemos intentado generar lazos profesionales donde prime la colaboración por sobre la dominación de una profesión sobre otra que es justamente lo que lamentablemente también está sucediendo ahora mismo con las colegas peruanas y sus casi 200 años de historia en partería profesional, en donde el Colegio Médico ha presentado un proyecto de ley para limi perdón, limitar su actividad profesional y en donde además se las tilda eh, a las colegas de una amenaza latente para los derechos de las mujeres y los usuarios cosa que hoy por hoy sabemos más que nunca que está alejado de la realidad y de la evidencia científica disponible. Entonces, muchas veces nos preguntamos con las colegas qué lugar tenemos en América Latina, las parteras profesionales, y cómo lograr un mejor posicionamiento. Y estamos seguras, incluso acabamos de, de escuchar a la colega también, que la respuesta es con mayor representación, y logrando direcciones de matronería en toda América Latina, tal como lo ha logrado recientemente Chile, y como lo viene haciendo Paraguay hace ya más de 20 años, con excelentes resultados, no solamente para las usuarias, sino también para nosotras las profesionales, incluyendo nuestras voces en la toma de decisiones, y subsanando grandes eh, diferencias de género en cuanto a liderazgo y en cuanto a remuneración, ¿Sí? que este es otro tema central en, en nuestra región, por ejemplo, en Uruguay las parteras profesionales deberían recibir un salario cinco veces mayor al que actualmente reciben para poder frenar eh, el multiempleo que afrontan como consecuencia de esto. Todos estos eh, altibajos forman parte de nuestra práctica diaria con logros y con desafíos en una región que como verán es muy heterogénea, eh, los datos hablan por sí mismos, están puestos sobre la mesa, eh, y ahora queda tomar acción y demostrar voluntad política para mejorar y favorecer nuestro ambiente laboral de trabajo. Esperamos que los estados latinoamericanos escuchen el llamado que hizo el doctor Tedros durante eh, la apertura de este evento y entiendan que el momento de invertir en parteras profesionales es hoy, invertir no solamente en números, sino también en educación, en regulación, en posiciones de liderazgo que nos las merecemos, y en todos que existan parteras profesionales en todos los niveles de atención sanitaria. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Flor, for that also very passionate input. And I'm sure we will come back to uh, the issue of professional uh, sort of collaboration later on. So now it's time for me to also call on Daniela Drandic. She leads the Reproductive Rights Program at RODA, Parents in Action in Croatia. And she has been working and works at the intersection of gender-based violence, human rights, and maternity care. She's a researcher, author, educator, and advocate for improving quality in maternity services and access to midwifery care. And this is a very important part of this panel because it's really about the consumer perspective, about the what, what women want and need. So please let us know, Daniela, from your perspective, what women's needs and wishes for maternity care are. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. This week, a group of my colleagues on the island of Korchula are organizing a millennial photo. You know the type with a photographer in a tall building taking a photo of a large group of people. Millennial photos on Korchula are usually for ads to entice tourists to, use the island, to choose the island for a summer vacation. 
But this time, the community is marking the retirement of their midwife, the only midwife on an island of 15,000 people. Slavojka Arsenovic came to work in Korčula 35 years ago. As a midwife, her official role was to be the administrator at the local gynecologist's office, to weigh and measure pregnant women, test urine, and take appointments she was told to stay in her lane. But she couldn't because that lane didn't allow her to provide the midwifery care that the women of Korčula Island so sorely needed. So for 35 years in her spare time, Slavika has helped women birth babies on roadsides, on ambulances, and of course, on the island ferry. The closest maternity facility you see is 150 kilometers away, over land and sea. Reproductive health care has been provided by midwives on Korčula for centuries. If that tradition had continued, today pregnant women from Korčula could have continuity of care in their community with collaboration from mainland specialists if needed. It would mean that they could turn to someone in their community in the case of a miscarriage or for a medically managed abortion, for contraception or for an annual exam. These are all things that they travel to the mainland for. Families need midwives who are well-educated, who have a comprehensive scope of practice and good interprofessional collaboration. Families need accountability and systems that support the types of positive outcomes that this year's State of the World's Midwifery Report show are possible if we invest in midwives. Families on the island of Korčula are depending on the government to ensure that they have the best possible maternity services to meet their needs. They know, and this report confirms, that midwives are what is needed. Governments who value women, families, and babies know that investing in midwives is a direct cost-effective strategy to full sexual and reproductive health coverage and freedom. As Korčula sends its only midwife into a well-deserved retirement, the community are grateful, but they're also very worried. Will the shortage of midwives mean that they will be left to fend for themselves? If they get a new midwife, Will she be as willing to bend the rules and provide the care that families need, even though she knows that she won't have the support of the healthcare system to do it? The best time to invest in midwives was 35 years ago when Slavojka first stepped off the ferry and began her career as a midwife on the island of Korčula. The second best time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. And I think what you really highlighted was not only what women as, as clients of midwives need and want, but also what midwives need uh, for, to be able to, to really work to their full scope of, of, of their practice. And that's really about what this report is so much about as well. So moving to the next speaker, and I would like, just before I do that, to encourage everyone to put questions to the panelists in the first panel and to the, uh, to the panelists in the second one, so that we can have a, a dynamic discussion afterwards. So let me now introduce Dr. Soraya Dalil. She is the director of primary health care for WHO. She is the ex-minister of health in Afghanistan. And among her many achievements as Minister of Public Health was the significant reduction in maternal and child mortality. She has also served as the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan to the UN Office and other international organizations in Geneva from 2015 to 2019. So welcome Dr. Suraya. You will talk about the midwives as a primary health care practitioner and how Midwives are essential to universal health coverage. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear panelists, distinguished colleagues, dear friends, first of all, congratulations for the report. I very much enjoyed reading it and it reflects 
lots of realities in the countries, in the field that uh, midwives and governments and all of us as partners face. I'm so pleased to see that this state of the world's midwifery report gave significant emphasis to the centrality of midwives in the implementation of primary health care. Indeed, the report states that midwives are essential providers of primary health care and can play a major role in this area and at the other areas of the health system. Midwives live and work in the communities with the women and their families. They are trusted friends. They understand the culture. They need to be respectful. They develop lifelong relationships with families and have the networks to ensure access to higher level of care when needed. It's important for midwives to be part of a network and to be connected with the network of care as well as with appropriate technology. People, individuals, families, and societies are at the heart of primary health care agenda. Primary health care focuses on people's needs and preferences as early as possible along the continuum from health promotion and disease prevention to treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care and as close as feasible to people's everyday environment. Primary health care is founded on principles of equity, human rights, and community participation. The work at the primary health care cannot be done without skilled, empowered, and will connected midwives. I would like to reflect on my own experiences in Afghanistan. What we did in Afghanistan was a combination of service delivery, health workforce, and policy innovation with regards to training of community midwives. The community midwifery education success is attributed to competency-based curriculum, one community midwifery education in each province, and having accreditation board. The outcome of this program over the number of years was from increased maternal and newborn health care service utilization to changing communities' perception of women's education and professional independence. And that is overwhelmingly positive. The community midwifery education program in Afghanistan combined education, empowerment, and health, and took it at the community level. The midwives that were graduated from the community midwifery education became not only midwives and empowered midwives in their community, but agents of change in their communities. So we, we understand that investments in midwives go a long way. I would also like to stress on, on helping midwives to organize associations and professional networks. We did that in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, Midwifery Association was created with support from Ministry of Health. We also took steps to bring them in the management and leadership position. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And I think this is really a very good example of how 
primary health care, universal health coverage, and innovation come together to contextualize what, what is needed for a country to materialize uh, putting midwifery in place in a regulated way. So thank you for that. We now move to uh, Ms. Angela Ngoku. She is the founder and executive director of the White Ribbon Alliance in Kenya. She is a graduate midwife and an accomplished thought leader. And Angela's focus is on ending preventable maternal and newborn deaths globally and amplifying the voices of and vulnerable populations around the world and in particular, of course, in Kenya. So Angela, welcome. And you will talk about barriers to quality of care for women during childbirth, the childbirth continuum and environment. So over to you, Angela. Can you unmute, Angela, is that? You're still... Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we yes. can hear you, go ahead. Thank you, I wasn't able to uh, unmute, I don't know what the problem was. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to share with you. Um, and I'm sharing this as a midwife who has practiced, but also an, as an advocate for women and girls and frontline health workers, midwives. I am I, I'm glad to hear everyone who has spoken, speaking the same language that what we are all known over tears that for the longest time, we know that women need quality health care in decent health facilities. And this means well-trained staff, medicines and supplies. But on a closer look, women are telling us that those basic services are not enough. I'm speaking this from a campaign that we did, the What Women Want campaign, that told us exactly what we are hearing today and what the state of the world midwifery report has told us, that women want enough midwives, well-supported midwives, but not that women want respectful care. I'm speaking from my own practice days and now as an advocate for quality health care and phone and health workers. I have observed over time that midwives face a lot in their quests to provide this much needed quality care. But every time there's a problem in a health facility, it is the midwife who is blamed. No one else is blamed. I'm not trying to say that midwives give the best, but well-supported midwives will give the best because I've seen it in practice. I can tell you today that midwives are faced with multiple barriers that almost immobilize them from giving that care that is so much needed. We all know, and we've spoken to it, and the, 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 the midwife realities, what midwife voice midwife realities report was in 2016 by ICM, White Tribunal Alliance, and WHO spoke to the realities that we're speaking about today. So let me say, we are still late in saving mothers and investing in midwives. We needed to have started long ago, if not yesterday. Midwives stand with women in every stage of life, offering comprehensive care, counseling, support services, and more. And we know that they are best placed to lead, to guide policy formulation and practice as it pertains to these issues, and advocate for the rights of women. Yet midwives' voices are rarely, if at all, heard outside their labor room. We need more midwives in leadership positions and at decision-making tables, in health ministries, in parliaments, and educational institutions. We know with this we are able to accelerate the sexual reproductive health priorities and concerns of women worldwide. We have also known for long that everyday midwives suffer from gender-based violence, discrimination and harassment in the workplace. It was not, it was not a, an adult during my practice as a midwife to hear midwives being told, no, you cannot do that because it has not been written down. Yet we know that is what was going to save a mother. We know that midwife voices, there has been so much harmful gender stereotypes and making it hard for midwife voices to be heard and to be taken seriously. This is evident in the economic rights, lack of recognition, lack of autonomy in their roles and a lack of a clear career pathway. Midwives need much better. They deserve better. They deserve better policies, better pay and protection. They deserve respect, status, and autonomy. We know 
that midwives' rights are human rights. We know investing in midwives accelerates the human rights agenda because we are talking about women's health, reproductive health, maternal and newborn health, adolescent health as a right, a health right. Then midwives' health rights, rights are also health rights. Midwives uphold and enable women's basic human rights to their health and decision about their bodies. And as midwives support women in bringing their babies into the world, they witness and safeguard essential human rights that begin at childbirth. Investing in midwives is a direct, cost-effective strategy to full sexual and reproductive health coverage and freedom for women and all who give birth. The report has already told us that midwives could meet 90% of reproductive health needs. And this is what I'm, I'm, I'm asking of today. We know and we've heard that midwives serve as gatekeepers for reproductive freedom and basic human rights. They are central to the fight for the rights of women, children, families, and communities. All too often, they are deprived of their own rights to rest and self-care. It is no, no, it, it's not a, it's, it's not a, an adult to find a midwife working in an isolated place over months, no leave, no nothing, no security, no nothing. Yet we know if you are overworked, you cannot provide this so much quality care that is needed. Midwives need decent work and pay and protection from discrimination. Pay closer attention to the What Women Want campaign that I talked about, and now the What Midwives Want campaign that we are launching together with ICM. It's more important more than ever now. There has been plenty of, plenty of global rhetoric about prioritizing the health needs of midwives. Let's also commit to protecting their rights. We need to work together towards a common goal. We need to leave the silos. It doesn't matter who you are or what it means in the healthcare team if we are not working together as one. That we need to work towards a common goal, that of propelling the midwifery forward, bringing global and national recognition and meaningful changes to advance this critical profession because it is critical. It is a best buy for sexual reproductive maternal newborn health. I'm calling on all of us here today and others not here to see to it that we increase focus and funding, increase the number of accredited midwives around the world, improve their working conditions and career progression, and increase their respect, status, and inclusion in decision making. We need to move from talk to action. The talk has been going on for so long. Let's act. And the time is yesterday, if not now. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. Uh, at Clary and Cole, as we've heard many today, but thank you for that spirit and really calling us to act. So I'll move to the next speaker. And the next speaker is someone that can, I think, speak to what Floor was mentioning on the importance of interprofessional collaboration. Our next speaker is Dr. Jean Conry. She's the elect president uh, of the FIGO, the Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. She's also the president and CEO of the Environmental Health Leadership Foundation. And that aims to improve the health and well being of women through systemic, systematic changes in healthcare delivery with a focus on the environment. So, as I said, you will talk about obstetricians and midwives as essential partners. Over to you, Jean. Thank you so very much, Annika. Director General Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, Executive Director Dr. Natalia Kenham, President Dr. Franca Cadi, on behalf of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, I offer my thanks to the World Health Organization, to the United Nations Population Fund, to the International Confederation of Midwives for the invitation to be part of all of these presentations. Distinguished colleagues, fellow speakers, and participants, I extend the voice of FIGO in this policy dialogue in the hopes that we build a healthcare workforce that will meet the needs of women, newborn, and adolescents. FIGO is the world's largest alliance of national societies of obstetrics and gynecology dedicated to the health and well being of women across their lifespan, from adolescence through maturity and to newborn and infants. Our organizational structure reflects this alliance, bringing together our member societies, regional federations, and important partnerships with organizations around the world that share similar missions, visions, values, commitments, and goals in progressing global women's health. Nowhere is this shared perspective more apparent than with our partnership with the International Confederation of Midwives. 
I truly believe that years ago, Mother Teresa expressed this alliance best when she said, I can do things you cannot, you can do things I cannot, together we can do great things. Figo believes that we will accomplish great things for maternal newborn health and that we only succeed through collaborative efforts. Sexual reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health are essential elements of not only sustainable development goals, but of women's health across their lifespan and in our investments in our countries. Only through investment will we see an improvement in this and the health and well being of future generations. The message from the State of the World's Midwifery 2021 is clear. We must invest in education and health system structures for all sexual reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health. Estimates from the report clearly suggest that we can only address even perhaps 75% of needs in the best of circumstances. And in low-income countries, as we've heard today, much less than 50%. By 2030, the forecast shortage is over a million personnel. What we know is that for us to achieve resilient healthcare systems, we must ground them in primary health care, which is vital to the health and well-being of every woman, every newborn, every child, every adolescent. Vigo recognizes that to have a robust global health system that is truly resilient, universal health coverage is essential. And universal health coverage must include essential health services, from preventive care, including reproductive decisions as, we, as we've heard today, as to if or when a woman elects to conceive, and specialty treatment to re recognition of the impact of environmental exposures on health and the fundamental inclusion of surgical care on global, the sta global stage. Nowhere is our need, the balance, appreciated more completely than in obstetrics and gynecology. We understand that to achieve success, we need an educated, trained, and effective work workforce, and we all need to work towards those goals. A successful strategy will rely on well-integrated and collaborative teams of healthcare professionals. Vigo is committed to being an integral element of resilient and robust global healthcare system. We are committed to a strong relationship with our midwifery colleagues, and together we invest in education and training to build a strong global health care system. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jean, and your words ring in my mind. Together, we can do great things. And I think let's that, let that be another clarion call for how we collaborate. I will now move on. And last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Smith. He's the Deputy Director of Implementation Research and Demonstration for Scale of the Maternal Newborn Child Health Team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's an obstetrician, gynecologist, and the global health strategist with 25 years of clinical and public health experience in developing countries. And if I may say, add to his resume myself, a great friend of midwives. So over to you, uh, Jeff. And you will be talking about using evidence. And I think that's also what Jean aligned to, but using evidence as the basis for funding support. Over to you, Jeff. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Annika. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues around the world. It's really an honor for me to be on this distinguished panel with incredible colleagues from across the spectrum of reproductive, sexual, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health and support for midwifery. We at the Bella Melinda Gates Foundation want to congratulate the team for the achievement of this brilliant report and are pleased to have played a small part in it. But more importantly, we are pleased to be partners with all these incredible colleagues working on behalf of midwives and advancing the cause of midwifery around the world. I'd like to focus my comments on just two things at, on how we at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation make decisions regarding investments that underscore the significant value of investing in midwifery. The first is the what, and the second is the how. The what is clear that midwives have tremendous impact. The publication in the Lancet Global Health in December of last year on the impact of midwifery showed us that universal coverage 
of midwifery services could avert two thirds of maternal deaths, newborn deaths and stillbirths. A two third reduction in mortality, that's impact. In fact, the evidence is overwhelming. Governments, donors and other development partners should invest more in midwives as a best bet and a way to solve the world's maternal and newborn mortality crisis. We know that the world needs more midwives and it is up to governments and partners to better support you midwives and your work. But we also know that midwives work within a system. They don't work alone. And when we look at WHO's health system building blocks, the focal building block is service delivery. All the others feed through service delivery to achieve results. And really for reproductive maternal and newborn health, midwives are at the center of service delivery. So the SOMI report provides excellent data, useful data on how service delivery structures can be modified to enable midwifery care. I loved the snapshot on Cambodia where very intentionally they increased the percentage of births provided by midwives through expanded access, improved quality, better education, clear regulation and strategic deployment. They were very intentional about achieving a goal. Now nearly 75% of births in Cambodia are attended by midwives. That's incredible. So what we need to do investing in midwives is unquestionable. But now we need to look at how we invest in order to maximize impact. We have a saying at the foundation that when we make an investment, we should do so in a way that doesn't leave impact on the table. That investments should maximize the capacity for impact. When we don't invest in midwives, we are absolutely leaving impact on the table. Our interest at the foundation is partnering with groups who can generate the evidence on how we overcome the systemic and institutional barriers that are preventing us from realizing the full impact of midwifery-led care. How do we use midwife-led birthing centers as a safer and better option to provide women the midwifery care that they desire? How do we look at service delivery redesign that includes midwifery continuity of care models at the center? How do we scale proven high quality education and training tools, including defined standards of care, core competencies and accreditation? How do we approach partnerships between midwives, nurses, doctors, obstetricians in a way that can be scaled and actionable across multiple countries? And how do we disseminate this learning, this information in ways that can catalyze action in the places where the burden is greatest? These are big questions to contend with, but the answers are needed, which is why reports like these and forums like this today are so needed to draw attention to the issue and to spur action. In these difficult and unprecedented times when resources are needed for so many challenges, we must not leave impact on the table. Therefore, we must invest in midwives because midwives represent underutilized impact for our health system and for the lives of women and babies around the world. Thank you and back over to you, Annika. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that. And I think what I really was so happy to hear is that you said investment, it's about maximizing impact and that is why we should invest in midwives. Don't leave it on the table. So I think in this panel, we have been able to cover and you've done all a brilliant job in sort of contextualizing what it looks like in different contexts, that investment is unquestionable, that the enabling environment is so important for midwives and for women, and that partnership is essential, that the inter interprofessional collaboration we can't do without, and that midwifery is really part of our materialization of universal health coverage and primary health care and that midwives are at the center. So thank you for that and we are now moving on to 
the broader discussion where all of you, and I see on my Zoom, I can see that we have 212 participants. And I know that there are a lot of people on the YouTube channel. And I have a little team that has helped me you know, gather the questions. And I would like to say to all the participants here, the panelists in the first one and in the second one, that even if I direct the question to someone in particular, if you feel that you have, you want to add something to that question, please do so by raising your hand. So the first question I have will go to uh, Ms. Neha. And the question is really, if, if midwives in Pakistan are able to provide comprehensive maternal care independently from antenatal to after delivery without doctor's advice. So Neha, if you would be so kind to switch on your video and respond. Is Neha there? I'm not sure that I see her here. Maybe it if looks like so. No. So I think this is a question that really uh, could be answered by anyone that has is very close to a country context. So what is the situation for midwives in, in different countries to actually be able to autonomously provide the care that they are educated for? So anyone who would like to respond to that, please put raise your hand. And I'll go to gallery view so that I can see the hands. Maybe I'll, I'll turn to, um, let's see who we can turn to here. Uh, Jackie Dunkley Bent, would you like to talk about this? What the situation is in, in the UK? Do we have Jackie there? Hmm. I'm fortunate that we do not have anyone that would like to talk about that question. Can we see again if there's anyone who would like to respond? If I, if I turn to you, Daniela, as, as you were already talking about the situations for midwives in, in um, Croatia and the, the situation where midwives really have to bend the rules to, to, uh, to do what they need, see is needed. Um, is that the same across the country? And, and what is, do you think, the solution there? And then I'll turn to um. you. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question, because the situation is the same throughout the country, but also throughout the region of Central and Eastern Europe. So while midwives are uh, having increasing levels of education, their scope of practice that um, is enabled by the healthcare system is still quite uh, subordinate. So most of them don't have um, the the regulation framework or the permission from the from the government or you know the legislative framework that they need in order to practice and we see this as very problematic especially in rural areas on islands and during covid because during covid what happened was that it was very difficult to get into the hospitals and it was very difficult to get into the um, clinics and there were no community-based midwifery services you know, in a crisis, women keep having babies. There's nothing that you can do to stop that. And we really found that we weren't ready. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I, I think I would like to turn to Floor as well to, to respond to the same question. What, what is the opportunity, uh, Floor, in your country for, for midwives to actually practice autonomously? Is it okay if I speak in Spanish once again? Yes. Thank you. Yo creo que acá la pregunta es una muy buena pregunta y creo que está muy relacionada 
con la regulación, ¿verdad? Y es parte también un poco de un círculo. Nosotros tenemos ya la evidencia científica, que es un paso muy grande, que nos dice que invertir en, en parteras profesionales tienen estos, estos y estos resultados. Lo que hay que hacer con esto es una muy buena tarea de, de abogacía y de incidencia política que lleve a un reconocimiento adecuado de nuestra profesión, de nuestras competencias, de los resultados que hay en invertir en, en, en parteras profesionales, que pueda hacer que se ajusten las regulaciones, ¿verdad? Por ejemplo, Argentina tiene una realidad muy particular, que es un país federal, entonces cada provincia, ¿sí? hay 24 jurisdicciones y cada provincia eh, tiene su propia ley de ejercicio eh, profesional de, de la partería, lo cual es muy difícil eh, regular esto debajo de una, de una única ley. Eh, creo que cuando tengamos esa, esa regulación acorde a nuestras competencias, alineadas a estándares internacionales que la ICM nos da, vamos a poder ser eh, autónomos, vamos a poder... Eh, estar incorporadas en todos los niveles de, de atención, eh, vamos a poder tener un liderazgo mucho más fuerte, mucho más potente, y finalmente posicionarnos, eh, por ejemplo, que es nuestro, nuestro objetivo, tal como mencioné anteriormente, eh, poder tener direcciones de matronería, ¿por qué no?, eh, a lo largo de, de toda América Latina. Es un círculo que se va cerrando y, y un, un paso va llevando al otro, tenemos un muy buen comienzo que es la evidencia, vamos por el reconocimiento, por la tarea de abogacía, por una regulación eh, acorde a estándares internacionales y por lograr nuestra, nuestra autonomía y posicionamiento. Thank you so much for those answers. And, and it, there is really a, a great need for regulation and accreditation and clarification of the role and scope of midwives. I will now go to another question here that was put to, uh, let me see, to uh, the minister or the ministry of India. And I think we have a representative, uh, Rati Alakha. So there was a question here to, to uh, Dr. Nipun Vinyak that um, provided, so all the efforts taken by the government of India are good in respect of starting midwifery training all over the country. Still, there is no visibility in the investment in the improvement of the environment for providing respectful maternal care and no mid midwife in the community. So is the government taking any initiatives in this area of a conducive environment and for a community midwife? That's a big question, but maybe you can start to respond to that. Thank you very much. Uh, good, after good afternoon, good evening, chair and panelists and my colleagues. Yes, government of India is taking lots of initiatives. You can introduce yourself also, sorry, I did. Yes. I'm Dr. Reddy Balachandran, ADG Nursing in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Uh, ministry has taken various initiatives to provide quality health care. Lakshya uh, uh, is one among that. Suman is another initiative. So various efforts have been uh, done to provide the mother respectful quality health care. And with regard to midwifery, yes, definitely nurse practitioner midwifery educator training has started in the in 2019. It is a six months uh, a residential program followed by 12 months uh, uh, mentorship, on-site mentorship. So unfortunately, because of the COVID, we could, we had to uh, it, the training was interrupted. Which, we, which will be uh, continuing very soon once the things are settled. So, and also the nurse practitioner midwifery, which is an 18 months course has been developed with the inputs from uh, international midwives and ICM and the WHO partnership. The curriculum has been finalized, which is of uh, very well uh, in line with the international midwifery competencies uh, designed by the ICM and WHO. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that sounds very promising. So we'll move on to another question here that I think I will want to direct to, to
to Jean Condry. Um, so in your country, yeah. how do you manage interprofessional collaboration to really provide independent midwifery care? And it might be your country, but it may also be uh, countries that you have experienced. So I can speak personally and then at, at an administrative level, if you will, from the United States. Um, personally, in my practice for 30 years with Kaiser Permanente, we had a collaborative practice. It did not start out collaborative. When we opened our hospital, um, oh, you know, for 30 years ago, we didn't have midwives. And the rationale behind that was we were training medical students, so we needed doctors to train medical students. And then we realized that actually we needed to train medical students very broadly, and midwives were a wonderful way to do that. So we started having midwives in a very collaborative practice. It has evolved so that we work one-on-one -on, -one on every project together. Um, we have a low risk and a high risk side. The low risk side of our delivery unit is very um, is coordinated and run by our midwives, but a physician is there to help with whatever comes up. So it's truly a collaborative. When we decided we needed to truly address um, major quality care initiatives around hemorrhage, eclampsia, hypertension, any of those, we then began um, a project where the midwives, nurse practitioners, and physicians worked together on every single project. So it is an evolution that is what I've seen, and an evolution that then fosters leadership, fosters the collaboration, and then fosters an expansion. Um, so I don't think anybody now would say that we wouldn't have that kind of collaboration. At the national level in the United States, it's a little more difficult because all nursing is, and all nursing regulations are state run. As are physician requirements, the, um, our um, boards and everything sit with our, our states. Um, so you have to go to 50 states to look at regulations. Um, ACOG as an organization partners with our midwifery organization to discuss issues. Um, they will, I attended their meetings and given keynote addresses on what um, physicians, how we collaborate better. Um, and we have them in our um, work groups and we are part of their work groups. So I think it's an evolution is truly what I've seen that brings us to where we are now. Thank you so much. And I think this is also a good illustration that nowhere, no matter where we are in the world, there are still challenges, there are still barriers to overcome, and there are systems to learn from. So we, we really, this, the issue of midwifery is really a global issue, and it's not something that is only the, the, the challenge for, for low income and middle income countries. Thank you for that. Um, and and maybe I may be so bold that as I as a moderator also can give an example from my own country where I think one of the most, and I'm from Sweden, one of the most important um, developments was actually the fact that all medical students are taught obstetrics by a midwife and they have to do independent deliveries together with the midwife. And the midwife is the main tutor there. So that's just one example. But I think the partnership and doing things together and learning and being, you know, uh, being sensitized in that way is really important. And a great point because that is exactly what we saw was almost like that turning point for us in our own medical practice. And my daughter um, delivered in France last year or two years ago and watching how her collabor her care with her midwife and that partnership with her physician was just uh, very robust and wonderful. So I agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Great, we'll have time for just a couple of more questions. And I have a question for Angela and Google. Um, so how has the White Ribbon Alliance overcome some of the barriers in advocating for quality care during the COVID-19 pandemic? And I think we can't leave this. How can we build back better for midwives and the mothers they care for? Thank you, Aneka. I think um, I would say 
that's a question that all of us need to be asking ourselves. But let me speak to what I have seen happening in Kenya. Uh, what we've done in Kenya is that uh, the kind of advocacy we do is not us going to the forefront to, to advocate. It's actually give, giving the power and voice back to the communities to demand what is quality care, but not to that giving power and voice back to the midwives to ask for what is needed. Speaking with them, working with them, uh, working with the broader healthcare team to actually say, look, if this area is loose, then all of us, we are not going to get anywhere. So at the end of the day, it's all of us coming together, whether it is the side of the government, whether it is the side of the civil society groups, the communities themselves and the midwives and the care that they give to come together and say, Let, let's look, it's, it's not working. These things are thick because COVID is here. There's, already, there's a, lot, a lot of movement from one area to the other for midwives because we know that is one of the barriers that midwives face. Where midwives work in a labor room, then when there's a pandemic, like the COVID pandemic or there's an emergency, they are taken to somewhere else. And then insisting and really putting the, their, their feet down and saying, if we move away from this, the, the mothers, because they're still getting pregnant, because pregnancies don't stop with pandemics, all of us know that. And if we don't work with them, then we are going to get to, to be in a more catastrophe than if we let midwives go to work in other places. I can tell you it has not been easy. We are still pushing. We are still pushing for ways in which we can work with not just the, the, the subnational, the sub uh, governments, but also the national governments to change their policies and practice. Working with the professional associations, with the regulatory bodies and the, the bodies that really like uh, de develop the acts of parliament and the policies to see how do we change and ensure that midwives, the place of midwives and the place of mothers really take center stage in policies and programs that are run in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there are more questions, but time is flying as it always is when you have, when you're enjoying a good and dynamic discussion or uh, having fun in other ways. So we'll have to wrap up here, but I can assure you that the questions that we have received uh, and we have uh, sort of archived here, we will make sure to see if we can send them to the respective panelists and see if we can provide a response back. But also I would like to say that in the chat, there will be uh, a couple of emails posted right now that will enable you to, if you have particular questions on the report on the metrics side, that you can write to these email addresses that Andrea now is putting in the chat. There will also be later on an address for more um, general questions in the UNFPA uh, page for SOMI. And I think the URL will also be posted here now. So let me just say a big and huge thank you to all the panelists. And this brings us really to the closing of this policy dialogue. And we look forward to continue the discussion, I wanted to say also, of the SOMI report in all possible uh, events and, and platforms. And there is the ICM Congress coming up which will also be another platform where we can discuss how we can accelerate and scale up the efforts to ensure that the gap of 900,000 midwife is closed by 2030. I will now ask Franca Cadet uh, to give the, her final and closing remarks. She is the current International Confederation of Midwives president, but she's also an, uh, an expert on midwifery and an advisor on international maternal health with over 30 years of strategy and policy developments, advocacy, leadership, project management, and partnership. And who else could be better than Franca to close this policy dialogue? Thank you. Over to you, Franca. Yes, you can hear me now, I think. You can hear me, Annika? Yes, we can hear you, and I hope that they will now highlight you as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Annika, for that introduction. And uh, honorable ministers, government representative, partners and colleagues, before I actually make my closing remarks, I would like to thank my brother, Dr. Tedros, my sister, Dr. Natalia Kanem, for your strong and steadfast collaboration. Thank you to Andrea and Martin from Novometrics and Petra from UNFPA. 
and the members of the joint WHO, UNFPA, ICM writing team and many others that made this joint SOMI report a reality. And thank you to PMNCH for lifting this report through your communication support. And thank you also to the Honourable Ministers of Health from India, Liberia, Jamaica, as well as the young midwife and chief midwife on the panel for sharing your insights and commitments to taking SOMI forward. Thank you to the speakers and questions from the floor. And last but not least, thank you to our very able moderators. Thank you, Anshu and Annika for moderating this panel so well. So we have heard quite some examples of good practices from speakers today. And despite clear challenges, we all agree that midwives are key to providing quality, respectful, sexual reproductive health care and rights to women and their families. Not everyone is aware that midwives not only attend women during birth, actually only about half of the needed care by midwives is for antenatal childbirth and postnatal care. Nearly 40% of midwives' care is for other sexual reproductive health care, such as counseling, contraceptive services, comprehensive abortion care, and the detection and management of sexual reproductive infections, and nearly 10% of our care is specifically for adolescent sexual and reproductive health healthcare. Now, this is the third SOMI report, and it is encouraging to see that much progress has been made in midwifery since 2011. There's much more recognition for the importance of primary health care and quality care. We see more accreditation systems for midwife education institutions and greater recognition of midwifery as an autonomous profession. Yet, and I imagine you probably knew a but was coming, I found it shocking to see how many issues such as shortages of midwives, the lack of an enabling environment, low quality education and regulation, no accurate disaggregation of data to show the real impact of midwives and pay inequity still persist. And we have to face it, too little has changed and this is not due to a lack of evidence. Yet despite these challenges, the world's oldest and most sustainable profession, midwives, as well as midwife organizations of midwives globally, united in the International Confederation of Midwives, are ready to rise to the challenge. And this makes me ask, ask everyone here today, is the world really ready and willing to embrace midwives? The report, the uh, SOMI 2020 report, calls for four bold investments or four key areas for bold investment. And the first one is the health workforce planning, management and workforce environment. And we are currently 900,000 midwives short. And Dr. Cannon pointed out that we must remember that most midwives are also women. And we understand and also experience the same inequities faced by women. And Florencia, one of our board members from ICM and a midwife from Argentina, reiterated this as she paints a picture of a patriarchal and biomedical model where midwives are still being marginalized. Yet on the other hand, great to see how a chief midwife in the Ministry of Health in Paraguay has made a significant positive impact on the situation of sexual reproductive health care for women in Paraguay. Daniela, on behalf of parents, has shown how not investing in midwives and undervaluing women, families and babies is holding back progress and respectful care for women in Croatia. And yet the Joint Secretary for Midwifery, Dr. Vinayak, who spoke on behalf of the Honorable Minister, Dr. Vardan from India, shows what can be attained at a very impressive scale when there is political will and investment to educate midwives to global ICM standards. Now, the second key area was high quality education and training and Neha from Pakistan talks about scaling up midwife-led continuity of care models and that this needs that to sustain that we need to address the challenges to midwife's education regulation and working environment and professor Jacqueline Dunkley Bent the chief midwifery officer for England shows how these processes can be supported and transformed when there are chief midwives in posts and posts that advise the ministers of health nationally and regionally and according to Jacqueline, midwifery care ripples through generations. I loved that sentence. Then the Honourable Minister, Mr. Mrs. Cuthbert from Jamaica, mentioned that their government will strengthen midwifery in Jamaica. They are currently functioning at 50% of midwifery capacity, and so they're now prioritising the investment in midwifery education and regulations, so it can be done. 
Then the third key area is about midwife-led improvements to service delivery. And Niha shares that despite poor maternal and neonatal health indicators in Pakistan, midwives still rank low in government scales, are not recognized distinctly or trusted as trusted providers, and are disallowed from practicing independently. Yet the example from Afghanistan shows that, change, that the change in investing in midwives can really work positively for society. And in his call for universal coverage, leaving no one behind, Dr. Tedros calls for a key role by midwives because it will not only save 4.3 million lives per year by 2035, but the quality of life of many more will be improved. That is why Jeff from the Gates Foundation sees midwifery as an investment that he doesn't want to leave on the table. And then the fourth, midwifery leadership and governance. Angela points out that the SOMI report in the SOMI report, 11% of countries surveyed reported zero midwives in health system leadership positions, and half have no midwife in the Ministry of Health. In Kenya, as in many countries, midwives remain at the bottom of the pay equity ladder. Yet there is, as she says, a triple dividend of better health, development, and gender outcomes when, we, when midwives are supported. Then the Honorable Minister, Dr. Wilhelmina, shared how midwives are acknowledged for their critical role in Liberia, and they have lifted midwifery education to a university level, and that has really improved midwives' career pathway. So we all agree we want optimal sexual reproductive health care for women globally. We all say we want to leave no one behind. We say we follow the evidence. And the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of investing in primary health care, including midwives. A logical next step is that we all, as a team, do everything we can to enable midwives to work to their potential to achieve our joint goals. Yet for those who have listened carefully, even today, some speak in vague terms and don't focus on midwives as the evidence reveals. And this is what most high, middle and low income countries have in common. We need to be aware that this is, is a systemic bias that will hinder our progress. The bias towards midwifery is evident globally from Sierra Leone to my home country in the Netherlands. If our goal is truly about a healthy next generation and not about power, we need to call it out. We need midwives in leadership positions Every government and international organization involved in sexual reproductive health and rights needs an independent chief midwife. Institutions, including hospitals, need midwives in their boards. University need midwife professors. We need midwives in parliament and as ministers of health. We need mid midwives to lead the care for and next to women. So not shared care, but it needs to be midwife-led care. That is the evidence. Through my experience as the ICM president, it has become my conviction that this is the main hurdle that has delayed the progress that we had expected to see reflected in the 2021 SOMI report. The International Confederation of Midwives and our 142 members worldwide are ready for the challenge. So what will you, what will every single member here listening do to support the world to embrace midwives. We now have the SOMI 2020 report in hand, and together with other rigorous evidence, it can be used to inform the efforts of governments and other relevant stakeholders. The report calls on us to build back better and fairer, following on from the pandemic. We must call in each other, or we must call each other to account and invest in midwives to make the needed shift to a fairer world. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And while this dialogue now finishes, let's continue all to play our part to support midwives to stand with women globally. We look forward to the WHO member states that will adapt a resolution on a new global strategy on midwifery and nursing at the World Health Assembly. And of course, look forward to the third and final launch of the State of the World Midwifery Report 2021 at our ICM upcoming virtual triennial Congress every Wednesday in June. I really hope to see you there. Thank you all for listening and thank you for caring. Goodbye.